diversity inclusion and uh, the culture brokering, or now we call it inclusion brokering. Is, see, that's a um, Sunday and a Monday, so I can theoretically. I'm sorry, um, Paula. Can, can you? Yeah, so I will. Um, Leslie, can I ask you to, like, when the time is, the, it's time to change the slides, I can ask you just to go through the slides, right? Absolutely. Great, thank you. So, um, so we're still on the front slide. I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of an intro. Um, but uh, just uh, the culture brokering, I worked with uh, SUNY, a nurse anthropologist. Oh, it's probably about 20 years now, and we've kind of refined it a bit, and I'll explain it as we go along. But it's um, basically a framework to think about when you're working with people who might be from a different culture or different experiences from your own. Um, and it's not rocket science, you'll see, but it, it kind of serves as a framework to help us really analyze all of the different factors that might be happening uh, when we're supporting, uh, working with another colleague or a person that you support from um, a, a different culture um, or, or someone, again, as I said, a different experience. Um, and so we developed this and the publication, there's some resources at the very end of the slides uh, if you want to do further read, reading or you can call or email me for further information. But just um, in terms of, and this is the second slide, please, the guidelines for today, um, uh, just basically sometimes when we talk about cultural diversity, cultural competence, it's somewhat, it could be uncomfortable, and I have my own challenges with this, as we all do, and I'll, I'll really disclose to you some of the challenges I have. But just I want this to be a safe space for, for exploration and discussion as much as we can do in this period. Um, to respect differences, of course, no question or no idea is dumb. Um, step up, step back is basically, you know, if you want to say something, step back. If you're talking too much, step back a little bit. Uh, or step up, step back, I should say. Um, and it's okay to make a mistake. You know, it's like, ouch, oops. Um, you know, if we happen to say an outdated phrase, you know, that's okay, basically. So, um, so slide three, please. Uh, and this is somewhat an, a little bit of an overwhelming uh, slide, and it really is the tip of the iceberg. Um, but um, we are... Uh, we, we really come across a lot of different aspects of diversity, um, cultural diversity and otherwise uh, our own and other people's also. You know, so this is just meant to kind of give a little bit of an overview in terms of some of the classifications. Of course, there's demographic, which is kind of the first thing, age, sex, gender identity, marital status. There's different abilities, you know, which we, uh, we'll sometimes call disability, but we have either physical, mental, cognitive, intellectual, emotional ability, disabilities. Um, we um, have different professional backgrounds and experiences. Um, we have different educational experiences, professional experiences in different realms. Um, people from different countries, of course, have different professional experiences. There's uh, factors that impact us around health, illness, medical conditions, even hun hunger and fatigue can impact someone's reception of services, for example. Um, I work a lot with uh, very underserved communities in Massachusetts, and when you talk about disability services, sometimes it's almost a luxury item for people. If you think about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if someone is worrying about a roof over their head or how to feed their kids, and they have a kid with a disability, it's the food in the roof over their head that's going to impact them, and that impacts their reception to services. There's the personal uh, dimensions of diversity, um, and also, of course, the cultural uh, in terms of language. So a lot of times when, um, when we think about uh, diversity, cultural diversity, and kind of what we need to do uh, for an intervention or a strategy to assist someone, um, human nature is to get somewhat of a quick fix. We, you know, there's, there's an issue or a challenge you want to fix it. A lot of times we will go to language. You know, it's, it's the interpretation. When that could be the issue and that's needed in terms of translation, interpretation, but there could be a myriad of other factors that are impacting someone also. Um, 
So we're going to go to the next slide uh, where it says think of the dimensions of diversity. Now, unfortunately, I can't access um, the, the webinar itself to see if anyone's writing on a whiteboard or anything, but um, if, can, can people actually talk? Are they muted, Leslie, or can people kind of contribute? Um, they can definitely okay. contribute. I'll unmute um, if you as a, if you don't want to contribute and you want to go ahead and mute your line back again, but I'll unmute everyone's line so they can contribute. Oh, great. And if someone chooses to write, maybe you can just tell me what it says because I can't see it. But Sure. So, so we often also think of people having um, a cultural background or a cultural system. Um, but our service system, as you probably know, also have and possess a cultural that's cultural and diverse elements. So let's think for a second of what the cultural. Oh, hello? 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 Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yep. Um, so what are some of the cultural and diversity factors of the West Virginia Center for Excellence around disability? Um, and then Think about that for a second. What are the cultural and diversity factors of your service system, of your USED? And then also, um, what are some of the cultural and diversity factors associated with the people that you all support? And particularly um, people that you might consider, you might consider um, people who are maybe hard to access, difficult to access, um, in receiving your services, so you know this is this is kind of free flowing. Anyone can go. Um, you don't have to get a list. Just one thing will be fine. Anybody? Paul, I'm going to go back to the last slide where you have the cultural and diversity factors listed. Yeah. If that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, I can I. We provide an, exa uh, an example of this also that's kind of common. But so a lot of um, uh, those of us who are on the dis in the disability field, we talk a lot about independence. Um, and back when I started in the field, I started in residential service, independence was taken to the nth degree. So it, it was almost our culture was to really um, – somewhat disconnect a person who was an adult with a developmental disability from their family or parents. Um, and the focus was that this is not a child anymore. They can rely on their parents or family. We have to disconnect them so much so that we would um, schedule times on Sunday and limit times that people could see their parents. Now, granted, this is back I'll tell you, late 70s, early 80s probably, so it's going to tell you how about how long I've been in the field. But um, So the focus was really on independence. Now, a lot of the families and people that I've dealt with um, and worked with from Haiti and some of the Southeast Asian communities, that is not a cultural aspect of, of their uh, communities at all. It's very family-oriented very close-knit family, and when you talk about independence from the family, that is a huge turnoff. So that's kind of some of the differences between our service system, um, and granted, it might be a little outdated, um, but, you know, I think to a certain extent, we still talk a lot about independence, maybe a little bit more about interdependence now, but that's a little bit of the difference. So how about you all, what, what are some of the diverse factors of your, you said, uh, and the people that you all support in terms of similarities or differences? Anybody? Well, uh, for me as a music therapist, you have to think about the role um, that music or musical aspects play for each person. Maybe uh -huh. someone really likes to you know, sing a song that has instructions in it while they're doing ADLs, like brushing their teeth or tying their shoes. Maybe people rely on music to help them relax or to pump them up for a workout or, um, you know, for relationships. So that's something that I personally um, have to think about for everybody. You know, one song might have a totally different meaning 
for, mm-hmm. as, you know, yeah. different clients, um, yeah. whether it be yeah. religious, spiritual, whether it be um, for wellness, whether it be for memory, um, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it sounds like from what you're describing, you've actually thought that through in terms of some of the context or the, you know, cultures and backgrounds of the different pieces of music and how some families or some people might take versus not take them, you know, versus religious versus maybe hip hop. Um, and then, you know, even, I don't know if you've ever uh, come across this, but there are some cultures where music may not be valued at all you know it might be considered yes, that's, not that's a good definitely thing. yeah that's definitely mm-hmm. accurate it takes a lot yeah. of reflexivity um, and that's why actually in in the field of music therapy we're starting to move toward calling it cultural humility because competence mm. yeah. might connote a sense of mastery <laughs> and there's that's no way I could ever be a, a master of, of any culture um, yeah you know whether you whether it, it fits with your philosophy or not but um yeah there's definitely more to it than just surface level (laughs) absolutely and that's a piece of the culture broker or the inclusion broker that we're going to get into in terms of what you said about not being able to master any any culture and the other reason too is that it's very fluid you know you might be uh working with uh some families or parents uh, one year and the next year, uh, you know, the, the culture is different. Maybe there you have taken on some aspects of other culture or some of us getting older might go back to our traditional culture that we had when we were um, younger, you know. So um, that, that's a really good point. Well, we're going to go to the next slide. We're going to – this is the definition that we used, and this is – it should start as what is inclusion, culture brokering. So um, I've – we initially called this culture, but it's kind of, it seems like it's more broader than culture because sometimes culture is kind of taken as, you know, just a certain amount of aspects, factors. Um, and there are many other different types of factors that are coming into play. But here's the original, um, the original definition that we've used, and it's called, it's kind of a mouthful, and we'll take it piece by piece. It's the act of Bridging, linking, or mediating among persons or groups of different cultures, systems, and backgrounds to prevent conflict, reduce negativity, produce change, and create inclusive programs and support. So initially, to give you a little history on this, we uh, developed this as a conflict resolution um, model, and it was used when there was a problem already. Um, and then we started thinking through the years, well, what if we use this model as more preventative, more proactive, and and thought of some of the issues in um, uh, uh, related to diversity before the problem actually was created. So, so we talked about reducing negativity and producing change to create inclusive programs and supports, but this this is more more or less the, the definition. So the second thing is the inclusion broker functions as a bridge between diverse groups and systems to establish connections and maintain coordination and communication. So as as brokers, and you've all served as in this role, this probably rings a bell. You know, you don't wake up in the morning and say, well, I'm an inclusion broker or culture broker. But but when we go through this, this is going to ring true for all of you, I'm sure. Um, But to really straddle... um, as a bridge between two diverse groups. You know, and it could be that you might be a 25-year-old speech and language therapist and you are working with um, a 60-year-old man with cognitive uh, developmental disabilities who comes from a very traditional um, Latino background. And so you are functioning as a bridge because you, what you, you're going to do is understand kind of where he's coming from not master his culture, but really um, gain some knowledge about where he's coming from. You also uh, have a wealth of knowledge about what your uh, professional job is, and you're functioning as a bridge between the two. So we're going to go on to the next slide. Um, And actually, I am going to, because of the sake of time, 
what we were going to do here is ask you what skills and knowledge are necessary to serve as an inclusion broker. But let's say we did this and move on because I'm trying to save some time here. We're going to go through kind of this information anyway. Um, but And forgive me for not making it as interactive as I can. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay. Um, so, okay, so the role of inclusion broker is the next slide. Um, so as mentioned, it, the person broker function as a bridge between diverse groups, and you want to maintain that coordination and communication. So these uh, these points are really important in terms of, um, and, and I'm sorry, the music therapist, your name was or is? I'm sorry, it's Grace. Uh, Grace, okay. This will ring true in terms of what you said. So the inclusion broker has a bit of knowledge on how groups differ from each other in the mainstream. You know, so you know some of the people that you're working with and the response or the reaction to music. And Grace, I'm sorry, I'm using your examples a lot here. So um, the other thing is that you have insight about human universals because not, you know, we're not all so not always differences between each other. There's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of commonality. So we also know about those human universals in terms of, you know, love and happiness and want, wanting to kind of exceed and do well in the world. Um, we can explain differences in nuances and values among groups. So as a broker, you can go to your bureaucracy and explain that, hey, you know, we just can't do things same, same old, same old, because we have to pay attention to someone's cultural values. Um, you know, we can't talk about independence all the time. We really have to pay attention to the family orientedness of this particular culture. Um, we are also continuously exploring our personal values, beliefs, and biases. And we're going to do a little bit um, in the next slide about how did we do that. Because we pay attention a lot to other people. We don't tend to stop and think about how our own values, beliefs, and, and our biases impact how we perceive and we support other people. So we really have to pay attention to that. And this next one is, is one that I've had personal challenges with, is the ability to be able to tolerate, not um, agree with, but tolerate different views, values, and or beliefs. Um, and when I talk about challenges, I grew up woman slipper, um, you know, you look men and women straight in the eye, strong handshakes, strong personality, all that good women's liver stuff. Um, and I worked a lot with uh, some very traditional Muslim families in Massachusetts, as well as some Southeast Asian families. My first interaction with um, a Cambodian elder, we, I finally got my foot in the door, I got to meet with a Cambodian elder after trying for a long time. And because of my Lack of knowledge, what do I do? I go straight in there. I walk right up to him. I shake his hand, firm handshake, look him straight in the eye. Well, if anyone knows anything about Southeast Asian culture, those are big no-nos. Uh, and I, you know, growing up and how I was socialized, I had to come to terms with that little thing in your stomach that says, okay, this isn't, this isn't quite right. This isn't the way I, you know, I'm a woman's liver. I don't have to look down. Um at a Cambodian elder. Um, and the other thing, you know, with Muslim families is being, is talking to the father and having the, the mom kind of stay in the background. So it, it's not to, to paint a broad brush about cultures. This is just my isolated personal experiences, but um, it really is that ability to be able to tolerate the different views um, and beliefs, even though kind of our inside voices are telling us, okay, this isn't, in my mind, you know, either quite right or quite how I was socialized. So the next slide is um, asking you, and, you know, do this somewhat, um, well, not too quickly, but we, um, we all have had our personal experiences in terms of how we've grown up and, and um, how we look and our own cultural aspects. So here's three examples 
And this is a, lo- a part of a longer self-awareness activity that I'll be happy to send you the full version of. Um, but the first one says physical appearance. It's, the definition is that viewed as differences between groups. Um, the question for you is, do you think your obvious physical characteristics, either your color, your race, your height, your ability, have influenced have your life? Have they, um, how have they influenced others, um, how others perceive you? Have you just experienced discrimination, and if so, how? I'm going to go through all three of them, and then you can pick which one you want to um, uh, take a look at, and then, you know, we'll spend a little bit of time sharing examples. And, again, if this is highly personal, don't feel like you have to. Um, ethnicity is a common sense of commonality that is transmitted through familial and community traditions and rituals. To what degree do you identify with ethnicity? How has it influenced you? And the third one is communication style. It's purposeful information exchange between two or more individuals to convey or receive meanings through verbal, nonverbal, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have, um, have you ever felt uncomfortable about others' communication styles? Have you ever felt undervalued because of your communication style? So if you can all take, uh, think about one, and if you would be so kind and comfortable as to share your own personal experiences and how this impacts you and will impact how you address other people, how you work with other people. Um, so give me a second to think about that, and um, anyone anyone can go either right or right. Or right, or right. Um, I just need to mute. I can I can start off with appearance. So I have um, pretty pronounced scoliosis, and as I get older, it gets more pronounced. Well, um, I and uh, so when I wear a suit with a skirt, the side of my skirt gets you know hiked up because your hip kind of sticks out and it brings up the skirt. So the reason I'm telling you this, I was going through DCA, the airport. Um, coming home from a meeting, I think, and the TSA agent called me over and she said, can I, you know, touch you or feel you, um, your size? And I said, yes. And I know what this is all about because I've experienced this before. And I said, is it because um, it looks like my, you know, my skirt's hiked up? She said, yes, you look like you're packing. Honest to God, said those exact same words. <laughs> And I said, no, no, I have scoliosis, so my hip is crooked, you know, I um, and it makes my skirt a little bit higher. And so she yells to the other guard, and I'm not trying to devalue her, it's just that education is needed here, um, to the other guard, because she didn't know what scoliosis was. She's like, she's got scoliosis. Oh um and I, you know, I explained what it was, and they let me go. But just kind of like this is an example how my physical appearance, and I've had other people ask me, it's like, why are you walking crooked? Um, you know, so I'm used to that. It's not a big deal. It might really, um, people might be sensitive about that, but I'm I'm used to that, of course, in the disability field, you know, we are. So that's kind of my sharing of my um, experience. How about anyone else? Hi, um, can you all hear me? Uh-huh. Yeah. Hi, um, I think that many of us actually experience um, to some degree if you are not from the area, um, might not be accepted mm-hmm. so much because if you're in a lot of these rural areas, if, you know, if you're know if you not from that area, you might not just be welcome. So, oh. <laughs> And um, we just oh. recently had a conference and I appreciate um, that uh, that was touched upon um, with some presentations because... I think a lot of us deal with that. I see. So are you saying that um, the, the people who live in the rural areas don't accept you or uh, people who are you're from the rural areas and other people don't accept you in terms of like which or is it all of the above? 
Well, I think it's more so that they live in the rural area, and I'm coming from, you know, a different region of the state. And because they don't know me, I, um, you know, I might well, not sound exactly like them. They've not seen me there. Um, well, so you're the outsider. Yep, we're an outsider's all right, yep. but sometimes building up that rapport, you know, and you'll <laughs> see, you know, afterwards, but that initial going in, sometimes you feel it, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, so that it. Uh, I'm sorry, someone else was trying to. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just in the homing, agreeing. I mean, lots of times you'll go to these people's homes, or you're, you see them, and if you don't accept their gifts, they are mortally wounded. Yeah. And. You know, yeah. you're not <laughs> not really supposed to or, you know, just depending on the capacity that you're there in, you know, even if you politely mm-hmm. decline, they're still, yep, that you're even more of an yeah. outsider at that point. It's a no-no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's a really, it's a really good point. Um, and I think of kind of the similar experiences with food, um, you know, always, you know, you, you really need to, uh, appreciate and welcome the food and and eat it. Um, and the other thing too is I don't know if you've noticed this, um, but it, with some cultures you don't get down to business right away. You need to develop that rapport, as you said. I mean, it's not a business meeting, you know, where you have an agenda. You need to. People will ask you, "Are you married? Do you have children?" Um, and it's it might be some somewhat uncomfortable for some people who are more business oriented. Um, and it's like, oh, I'm not here to share about myself. But if you don't do that, you know, if you totally kind of overlook that and don't do that, it's going to take you twice as long if you're lucky. You know, you might never develop that rapport with people. So um, good example. Thank you. Any um, any others? It's it's hard because I can't see you all, so I'm gonna you know, wait a second. And then, um, any any others, feel free. So this is Grace, the music therapist again. Uh, last mm-hmm. Thanksgiving, uh, we actually had some uh, young ladies from the Czech Republic who were studying social work um, over to our house. Long story, my mom's very friendly and met them out in public and invited them. Um, but they were talking about idioms. And the, like the phrases in, in English that um, they wrote down, like, and, and part of my language, one of them was, you know, ride my tail or ride my um, ASS because oh, yeah. they were in the car with mm-hmm. my mom. She was like, oh, that guy's riding my tail. And they were like, oh, what does that mean? And wrote it down. They oh, kind of giggled that. at it. Um, but yeah. like cultural idioms um, yeah. that might not directly <laughs> translate. Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, I was thinking of a gentleman from Nepal I worked with who I said six and one half dozen in the other, and he's just like, what? <laughs> you know? um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so you're you're aware of how you have been socialized, some of the idioms, and you know some of your cultural values, and even geographical, regional. Um, and you, so see, we're, we're getting into the broker where we're understanding ourselves and where we're coming from and understanding how other people perceive us and where they're coming from too. So, um, okay, the next slide, if it says effective inclusion brokering can be learned, uh, we're going to go right by that um, and go on to the next one where it has like 3,000 words on a slide. So. <laughs> There's a science that tells you not to put, what, more than 12 words on a slide, I think. <laughs> we never believe that, but it's only because this is actually the model, which kind of looks like it's kind of blow you away, but it really it really is, and it's pretty, um, it's pretty basic and um, simple. I, um, so the first thing we're going to look at, in, if you have a, uh, in your slide the text in green that says stage one, does everybody have that in green or says stage one, right? It's underneath the diversity factors that we've repeated. So, okay, so so here's the model itself. There's there's a stage one, which is either you want to do proactive planning, as we had mentioned before. Um, again, as the model was developed, it was conflict prevention or conflict resolution. Um, there, uh, there's a need due to a current conflict and there's a communication breakdown. So either there's some problem or there's some problem that you want to 
avoid, and that's basically your first stage. Uh, typically, what we'll do in human nature is go right to stage two, um, and we might give it some little bit of thought in terms of the analysis of what's going on, but human nature is to go to an intervention, go to a strategy. What we're saying is that you go bump yourself up to all of those demographic, ability, professional, all those factors that we've already talked about, and, you know, basically ask yourself, you know, again, a framework for thinking, what is going on with this family? What's going on with this individual? Um, And take a look at all of these things, which either can be serve as a challenge to you, or it can be um, an asset to you. So let's, for example, we often think of a service system as bureaucratic or red tape, but let's face it, service systems are also resources. They provide money for us. Um, so, so basically, if, if to analyze all of these different factors, you can have all the translation, interpretation, and be sensitive to a culture um, in the world, but if someone is experiencing hunger and fatigue and stress, it's not going to help at all. So it's really important to take a look at all of these things that might be going on. Only then should we go bump ourselves down to stage two and look at all of the potential interventions that going to, that will help you in this situation. Um, and then in an ideal situation, you're going to move on to stage three and have a positive outcome and establish connections and create a good maintenance. However, if you do have a negative outcome, someone decides they're not going to come back, they're going to agree to an appointment and then never show up, no show. It's typically because we forgot something up in that top section there. Like I said, either we're not dealing with someone, it's a medical condition or an illness they haven't told you about, um, or we've done something around gender roles that maybe people don't agree with. Um, so it's typically that we haven't done the, the most comprehensive job in the um, analysis of it. So I, I'm going to show you an actual example of uh, this in action in a second. But um, the next slide, which um, has these tiny little words, and I'm not going to go through every one. This just takes uh, um, the um, intervention strategies that that were in stage two and gives you the definition and then an example. Um, So here's one, we'll go through the first one as an example. So mediating can be defined as preventing or resolving a conflict among individuals by serving as a go-between. Okay, so it could be that you um, are adding, for example, uh, a code of conduct statement and a mission statement, or you're adding a sign to a restroom stating that everyone is entitled to use whatever toilet they self-define um, or most appropriate for their gender identity and gender expression. You know, so basically you're mediating, and this could be, again, for R, you said it came up as a result of an issue. This was an actual example. Um, because of an issue that we had. Um, So we actually did that as uh, a resolution. However, if you don't have a problem with it and you are being proactive, you could add that language to your restroom right now, for example. So, you know, basically these are all sounding very familiar to you, especially if you go into social work school like I have, Um, and it has the definition and it has just an example here of which you could probably provide many of. So we just use that for a reference. But if we go on to the next slide, we'll see the culture brokering model in action. So let's take a look at this block here where it says following a meeting with this professor, um, and this is the stage one, a student is referred to the student disability office and agrees to an appointment. But he doesn't show up for his appointment. He doesn't attend class. Um, So what's going on here? What what are some of the factors that that went on? So we did some careful analysis. And if you bump up to the top block, it says, first of all, the student is from a very traditional Pakistani family. Secondly, the 
the university has a very significant Pakistani student population. Next, the professor talked to the student regarding reasonable accommodations for students who may have difficulties learning. Another factor is that the student remembers a village member who could not walk and was transported to another country to beg, and that was the perception of disability in his mind. So he never heard this, the term learning disability. Um, and then the other thing is that the Institute for Asian American Studies at UMass is knowledgeable and sensitive to cultural issues of disability and has many connections to the Asian, this is supposed to be community-based organizations. So this kind of seems like a different kind of myriad of different things thrown in here, but this was the analysis of some of the assets, the, the positives, and some of the challenges that were being faced. You know, so we have here cultural sensitivity to the word disability. Um, the student was from a very traditional Pakistani family. Um, the university, which could be seen as a bureaucracy, uh, as an asset in this case, has a very significant Pakistani student population. Um, on a challenge uh, point, the professor talked to the student regarding reasonable accommodations for students who have disabilities who may have difficulties learning. The student heard the word disabilities in, in his head. He remembers a village member who could not walk and was transported to another country to beg. He never heard the term disability, but he has in his mind the word disability. Um, and on a positive resource note, the Institute for Asian American Studies is knowledgeable and sensitive to cultural issues of disability um, and has, again, many uh, connections. So after that really uh, good analysis by whoever was doing this, we're going to develop the strategy. So we're going to go down to the block on the right. So um, here's the strategy. Another Asian student with a disability was defined through the disability office to serve as a mentor. The Asian community-based organization provided culturally responsive disability training to faculty. Um, disability inclusion concepts was integrated in um, courses, um, so that it was just kind of naturally threaded through. Uh, the professor visited and uh, met with Pakistani Community uh, Center in families' neighborhoods, which was initiated by the institute also. So the professor was a little acclimated to more of the Pakistani culture in the community. So let's see if we just um, paid attention to the student needing resources from re reasonable accommodations from the disability offices, and we didn't pay attention to all these other factors, we most likely could have had a negative outcome. In this case, the positive outcome was the student did start attending classes. He received assistance with learning accommodations, um, and the faculty and staff received training on Asian perception of disability from the Institute. Uh, and also, sorry, I skipped one. The Pakistani community received info about disability and services through the community center. So, you know, as a question to you, um, if the professor or staff just sat down with the student um, and said, well, you know, this is, this is how we feel about disability in this country. It's valued and you know, there's really nothing wrong with having a disability. You know, some of us need different accommodations to help us out. Um, and didn't present it to the Pakistani community and didn't somewhat, I'm going to use the word normalize, uh, by adding, uh, integrating it into courses. So, so what they're doing in a very smart way is really uh, integrating and normalizing disability so it's presented to the whole community. Um, rather than, you know, just this particular student because it's much more, um, the student could be much more receptive as well as his family. Um, and also pairing this student with another Asian student with a disability who was actually very successful in the college was an, another asset and ended up being a successful case. Now, we all can't 
have the resources and some of the time that goes along with this. Um, this is kind of an ideal case, I guess. Um, however, you know, in some aspects by doing this up front, you're going to save yourself time and, um, and have better success later. Um, but also, you know, if you try to kind of like do as much as you can in the analysis and the strategies, um, it, it will be uh, a little bit more successful. So is that, um, again, I can't see your eyes if your eyes are glazed over, but does that make a little sense? It takes a little bit of a while to process. This is usually a day training, by the way, so really this is a crash course. But does it does the concept make sense? Or do you have questions or concerns about it? Okay. I think it makes Any? sense. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So um, I know we don't speak for everybody, but, again, you know, take – Take a little time to kind of process it, and I'd be happy to do any kind of follow-up. So in our remaining few minutes, let us uh, we have a little bit of a case here. If we go on to the next slide where it says it begins about a planning team, um, focuses on recruiting more military families with members who have developmental disabilities in West Virginia because they found that, you know, that's, there's a lack of this population. Um, in your recent you said conference. So I'm pretending that you're all having a conference. <laughs> the conference planning team, uh, they were all you said staff, noticed an increase in requests for halal and kosher meal. Halal, um, if anyone doesn't know, is the Muslim traditional food and meal preparation, which was provided. The team was confident that they asked the correct registration course questions and fulfilled every request. So during the event, the conference staff noted that an unanticipated number of participants requested a separate quiet space or room away from the noise, lights, and other stimuli of the conference. Now remember, we're tr we have uh, a military staff, former military staff, who are coming to this conference, as well as uh, Muslim uh, population and Jewish population. Staff noticed a request for a quiet room for prayer also. The staff directed participants oops, get my phone, uh, to use their own hotel rooms for personal activities. However, all rooms were in hotels across a busy street from the event venue. The planning team was surprised that the conference was critiqued for lack of a quiet space because no requests were made in the other section in the registration system. So the question for you in the, the last remaining minutes is, what are the potential factors impacting this event? Um, culture, health, what could the team have done differently beforehand? Um, and thinking about even who was on the, the actual planning uh, committee. Um, and the last question, is there anything the team can do post-conference kind of damage control? Um, so let's think for a second, and anyone can jump in on any of these questions. Hi, this is Carmen. I was mm -hmm. thinking with the when they noticed the increase in requests for specific types of meals, maybe the yep. planning team could have done a little research on cultures that that might impact to see if there were some mm -hmm. issues that they hadn't captured. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, given that uh, we know a lot of the military families might be uh, military pe people might have, you know, especially the recent soldiers um, experiencing post-traumatic uh, stress um, and also um, halal meals, you know, that if they had done some of the cultural investigation first, they might have um, projected this. But the other thing, too, is uh, when you have a conference planning team, and you probably all know this, I'm sorry if I'm stating the obvious, is that the you want to have people representative of the people that you want to attract, right? 
um, because had you had someone, you know, from those respective communities and populations, they might have told you, you know, this this is what we need to have. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Any ideas or suggestions for your own planning team here? <laughs> I think, Paul, I think that having an evaluation and then maybe even an additional message of, you know, your information is valuable, um, we will use this to make modifications in the future and then mm -hmm. make sure that you do it. Yes, absolutely. Conference. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, you, that great suggestion. This is kind of a little snippet, a really quick version of the uh, using that model. Um, so you all got A's on that one. Um, so just, you know, real quickly, we have about three minutes left, but the next slide is attributes of an inclusion broker, um, is that you want to proactively gain insight and implement preventative strategies to avoid the potential conflict. So using this model as a, as a proactive preventative model, uh, rather than waiting for a problem to happen. You want to become educated in the mainstream service in communities, diverse cultures, um, and diversity. Uh, you want to intervene in conflict situations to ease tension. Uh, you know, the other, I'm going to skip one here, is to maintain neutral roles is important. And again, something that we have to, I have to work on sometimes. Um, you, you definitely will function in one more systems while brokering between systems, so that's kind of the neutrality. Um, and the culture broker historically, uh, the brokering is not new. It actually in history comes from um, a, a person who was kind of appointed to deal with the royalty, um, between the royalty and peasantry to be able to gain favors and, and um, communicate, you know, so it's not a new term at all. Um, you want to be aware of your own personal values, beliefs, and bi uh, biases, and you know, try deal with others positively, um, and cultivate uh, varied social relationships. So when you get invitations, yes, accept them. When you get offered food, yes, accept them, um, and maybe not get down to business right away. So. Um, and again, the last slide is basically um, the monographs that we created um, and the book that was published by Sage on culture brokering, which, by the way, um, has authors from a lot of different cultures who have written on different cultures, you know, in terms of the culture brokering model and use that. So um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty expansive on that. And of course, you know, I, I must mention it's it's not to paint a brush, a broad brush, that all cultures will act the same. It's not that. It's just kind of things to to pay attention to, or some of the more common traits of different cultures. Um, but again, not a prescription to be used. So, uh, right on the button on three o'clock. I don't know if if there are any questions or Leslie, do we get cut off? get a minute or something or no, no no we're good if anyone has any questions definitely feel free to ask before we close out thank you so much you you finished right on time we did it yeah and um yeah not everyone's comfortable or you know sometimes you think of questions later on my email i hope i yeah i put it right on the front there if you want to shoot me an email with any other questions for the questions or concerns or you know even if you have a problem with the model, you know, please, you know, feel free to do that. And thank you for your attention and thank you so much for your patience with some of the glitches that have happened. No, it's our pleasure. We appreciate your time and you, you tried it not just one week, but two weeks in, or, uh, you know, two sessions in a row and, and you're very persistent and we really are grateful because this has been a very informative session. Thank you very much. Thank it was happy to. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. We appreciate your time, too, and um, have a good day. Thank you. Bye.